Yes. I mean, the, the polls in America suggest that if you define atheist in a sort of more neutral way as secularist, non-believer, sometimes they're called the nuns, uh, then you, you find about 20% of, of Americans fall into that category. But if you define it as, as, if you use the word atheist, then it drops to about 2%. So, so um, just simply changing a word for exactly the same thing. Julia Sweeney, I've often told this story, but it's very, very funny. Julia Sweeney, the American comedian who did this wonderful uh, one-woman show called, I think, was it Letting Go of God, something like that, uh, describing her own escape from Roman Catholicism. And it's a very, very amusing, very witty one-woman show. And towards the end of it, she describes her mother's reaction when her mother read in the paper that she was an atheist. And her mother said, said this, said, well, I don't mind you not believing in God, but an atheist? <laughs> Ironically, the best way to predict what somebody is going to tend to do is just to ask them. I mean, that's, you ask, that's why it, you know, talking to people, actually, it's not that they can't deceive you or it's not that they can't be self-deceived, but the people who are telling you what they're interested in and what they want to do and what they hope to have happen and you know, the, 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 the neo-Nazis who are going to protest uh, and have their placards, uh, uh, and their websites and all of their efforts, they are advertising their conscious states ad nauseum. And who, who knows if any one person really believes what he says he believives. Uh, there's, there's, there is a distance between what people profess to believe and what they actually believe or what would be behaviorally uh, operational. But we, we know a lot about what people will do based on what they've done and what they say they want to do. And, and I don't know that a brain scan is going to get much, it's not going to get much better than that predicting across time. It, may get, it gets better than that in the moment. So for instance, we, we know we could all go to a, a psychology lab tomorrow and get tested on various stimuli and have our innate racism uncovered. And whether or not you think you're racist or not, we know virtually everyone shows some racial bias when put through this, this, this paradigm of um, uh, the implicit association test, and you're just slow. So if we showed you positive words and faces of, of very various races, your race and, and some other race, um, uh, you would be slower to associate positive words to the 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 outgroup face than to your own group, uh, and quicker to associate negative words. And, you, and no, no matter how liberal you are, no matter how embarrassed you are, no matter how much you want to prove to the experimenter you're not racist, you will fail to demonstrate uh, a lack of, of racial bias. So that's insight into the nature. So that's something you can know about yourself and be on guard for its, its um, insidious effects in your life. Uh, uh, and it's a, it's, a, it's a good ethical norm to want to correct for it. I mean, this is, just, this is something we want to get away from. Uh, and we're right to want to get away from it, but uh, science can, can, can dig into the details of, of our minds even now in ways that we, we uh, uh, might find surprising. Ian. We have actually moved quite a distance from that compared with 200 years ago, 300 years ago, 400 years ago, the era of the Inquisition and this sort of thing. And so, so to say that it has such a grip it has a fraction of the grip that it once did on the operations of human conduct and of society. So the real question is, if implicit in that is, given what we know of science, why would religion still have any grip at all? Not does, why does it still have a big grip? Because it's not a big grip when you look um, in, the, in the, the developed world. So, in fact, most of Europe are just, they're eight, you know, the whole countries where religion has essentially disappeared entirely. And the countries are not, the countries are not full of violence and, you know, it's just the assumption that you have to be religious to be moral is a false one. It's empirically false because you just look around in places where that's the case. So, um, so, so, so that's one fact. And we, pull away from that a little, there's plenty of what goes on in religious texts that has tremendous value to how to think about life and how to treat one another. Uh, in fact, uh, Jefferson created what 
was essentially what you can think of as the Jeff Thomas Jefferson, the Jefferson Bible. I don't know if you ever heard of this. He went through the Bible, and I think both the Old and the New Testament, and he crossed off everything that was sort of mythical, magical, uh, things that clearly violated known laws of nature, and kept the rest and said, here is the, the stuff of the Bible that will, should have value to any modern person going forward. If you look at people who are religious today, who are not in conflict with science, they have viewed their religious texts as a spiritual, something that gives them spiritual support, not as a science textbook. The, the, inter, the, the conflict in society is when you have those who are still religious, who want to use their religious text as their access point to understanding the natural world. And persistent efforts of the past to make that happen have just simply failed. The, the, the Bible does not work as a science textbook. In fact, Galileo knew this, and he himself was a religious man. He's famously quoted as saying, the Bible tells you how to go to heaven, not how the heavens go. And these days, science has gone way beyond that. We know a lot more about what is happening. We can literally see memories being formed. We can see the chemical changes in neurons. So the soul is supposed to also have memories. How do the memories get from the neurons to the soul? We know that brains often have false memories in them. Do the, does the soul in the afterlife carry those false memories, or are they somehow corrected after death? We even know the laws of physics by which the atoms, the electrons, the elementary particles in our brains behave. We know the equations that the electrons that are responsible for, for chemistry obey. And there's no ambiguity in these equations. They could always be wrong. It is always possible to say, well, we just don't know what is going on. That's fine. But what we have is the evidence of every experiment ever done telling us that these equations are correct. To overcome that, we would need very, very strong evidence. Just one experiment telling us how the soul is pushing around the chemicals in our brain, but we don't have that. What science says is that life or consciousness is not a substance like water or air. It is a process like fire. When you put out the flame on a candle, the flame doesn't go anywhere. It simply stops, and that is what happens when we die. So we're faced at the end with two scenarios. One scenario says that everything we think we understand about the behavior of matter and energy is wrong in a way that has somehow escaped notice by every experiment ever done in the history of science. And instead, there are unknown mechanisms that allow information in the brain to be transferred to blobs of spirit energy that persist after we die and can talk to the other blobs of spirit energy, but don't talk to us except sometimes they do. The other scenario says that physics is right and that people under stress sometimes have experiences that are not actually real. On the basis of rationality, it is not a difficult decision to choose between these two options. On the basis of emotion, it might be difficult, but we need to have the courage to live life here in the actual world. Thank you. Religion is a, a combination of, of debasement and servility. I'm returning to a point I made earlier with the most extraordinary solipsism. I'll try and put that uh, better. Uh, in return for your being told that you sinned before you were born, we had a quick refresher on that just now. You sinned, you committed crimes that are original to your species, that we, for which you have no direct responsibility, but for which you cannot shake yourself. You're born guilty, created sick, commanded to be well, as Fulk Gravel puts it. And that in the Quran, you're told you're made out of a clot of blood. <coughs> <clears throat> by your creator in the Bible, it's from the dust, and then women uh, wrenched uh, even from that rather muddy, imperfect uh, creation as a lesser species. All this, um, and that you must go, as we all used to have to do, and confess your sins, say, mercy on me, a miserable sinner, wretched, guilty, unworthy. In return for that humiliation, in return for this total abolition of your, of your self-respect, this conviction of having done wrong, you're told, but... There's good news. The universe, the whole constellation, the whole, the whole celestial globe, the whole thing was designed with you in mind. So you can be from someone totally abject and totally shamed 
a complete solipsist, a raging egomaniac, the center of the universe, someone for whom it's all been planned. And not only that, but God has a plan for you too. And not only that, he was prepared to subject one of his children to revolting torture uh, to prove his love. If you'd been present when that sacrifice, that human sacrifice was going on, you would have been in duty bound to try and stop it. But if you did, you wouldn't have been saved. If you'd done the moral thing and said, stop this now, I can't watch a human sacrifice, I can't watch someone being crucified. Stop it. No. You do that, you've missed your chance for salvation. This is madness. This is madness. And how many generations of humans went by not even knowing of this fantastic idea, dying in misery and ignorance and shame before it was suddenly decided, maybe I'll, I'll torture a son to death today and rescue the rest of them. Who can believe this? It's, it's an insult, it seems to me, to, to self-respect in both ways. It hugely aggrandizes our importance in the scheme of things, and it greatly uh, diminishes us uh, as autonomous individuals. It belongs, as I say, to our, to our childhood. Now, as for the Amalekites, listen. The firstborn of Egypt, every firstborn male child in Egypt has already been killed on a whim, just so these people can make their escape under cover of night. Uh, I don't remember the, whether it's said of the firstborn of Egypt that they were members of the Al-Qaeda organization or whatever fantastic allegation you made against the Amalekites who are so thoroughly destroyed that we'll never know anything about them, like the Albigensians. We hardly know what the heresy was because of what, what a thorough job the Pope did. See how the Christians love each other, by the way, on these occasions. Um, what did the firstborn of Egypt ever do to this loving God that they should have their lives taken so his chosen people can run away? What's moral about believing this? What morally normal person will say they want the destruction of children for their redemption in Canaan? Professor Weinberg, Stephen Weinberg puts it quite well, I think. He says, um, for uh, <coughs> in a more morally normal universe situation, people of goodwill will do the best they can, and people of ill will, psychopathic types, wicked types, evil types, will, will do the worst. They will do wicked things. If you want to get good people to do wicked things, you need religion. What do I mean by that? I mean to say that who, when they see a newborn baby arriving in their life, if anyone's ever thought, even myself, well, maybe there is something to this. Look at the, look at the perfection of this little bundle. Look at the little indentations, all of that, and the finger, fingertips. All um, the, the most you know, leathery old cynic uh, like myself can have these feelings. We're not total strangers to the transcendent and the numinous, you know. But, but they said, I tell you what, though, before we go any further, we need to get a sharp knife or a stone from somewhere and start hacking away at the genitalia of this little bundle. Because if we don't, we uh, won't be doing God's will. Now, where it, no moral person would do such a thing unless they thought it was divinely warranted. No moral person, I say, would... Uh, show contempt and disgust about the female birth canal, as all religions invariably do, and about activities related to it, I may say, in both directions. Uh, revol revulsion from it, disgust from it, scorn for it, um, and for all other forms of sexual uh, congress. There seems to be a dread underlying all of this, a dread about the genitalia, uh, a horror of women, a horror of their monthly effusions, uh, a disgust, as I say, for their for their vaginas, that I don't find healthy. But it seems to me, in two senses, man-made. One, mammal-made, and two, made so that men can subordinate women, which seems to be a consistent finding in all religions. You will know that the pious Jew has to begin every day saying, God is to be thanked for not making me a woman or a Gentile. That's not moral preaching. No one goes around talking nonsense like that unless they think they have divine permission for it. I was speaking to a friend of mine just yesterday, whose father was a Holocaust survivor, and he said he said to his father one thing before he died, what one lesson would you take from the Holocaust? And he said, I take this lesson. When someone says they want to annihilate you, believe them. Don't think they're joking. Don't think they don't mean it. The Israeli people have reason not to want or need you and your opinions on their future. In 1973, when Israel, six years after the previous attempt to annihilate it as a state, state by its neighbors, once again saw its neighbors' armies amassing on the borders, the Israeli government wanted to strike preemptively to stop that war. They didn't. 
They didn't, among other things, because they knew that if they did strike preemptively, America would not provide them with any munitions. Kissinger said this himself afterwards. So they waited, and they were attacked, as they knew they would be, and they lost many good people. But they were then able to retaliate. They were then able to push those armies out of Israel. But, but, and this is a crucial thing to remember, the American planes were not allowed to land and refuel, bringing supplies to that country when it was on the brink of being ended, were not allowed to land in any European country even to refuel. When Israel was about to be ended, you couldn't even stop a plane for a couple of hours on European soil because the Europeans cared more about the oil deals they were doing with Arabs than they did about the future of that state. Since October 1973, not a single Israeli has thought seriously that when they were about to be annihilated, you or any Europeans would lift a finger, and they knew you wouldn't, and they were right to know you wouldn't, and you wouldn't. When Israel is pushed to the situation it will be pushed to, of having to believe they mean it, and when every bit of jiggery-pokery behind the scenes runs out, and when the UN and distinguished figures have run out of time, and Iran is about to produce its first bomb, Israel will strike. Every single country, including this one, people from our elegant diplomatic service, people from America, everyone, will condemn Israel. Everyone in the Middle East will condemn Israel. And they will go back to their homes and they will say in private, thank God for Israel. The Saudis, the Bahrainis, the Egyptians, the Libyans, the Lebanese, everybody will say, thank God they did it. Because nobody else would. The proposition being put before you tonight is that you have a choice between war and an Iran with the bomb. You have a choice, as has been said before, between war and dishonor. You'll choose dishonor this evening and you'll get war. You have the choice between a war with a nuclear Iran or a war at some point with an Iran that is not nuclear, which you stop from ever being nuclear, and hope that in 